you cue me at 10, Josh. <laughs> 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the continuation of the Milwaukee Poetry Series this 14th season. I'm Tom Hogan, the coordinator of the series, and I want to welcome you very much for being here. Thank you. This particular reading has been a long time in coming. Quentin's reading originally was scheduled in May of 2020, but we had to postpone those spring readings because of the pandemic, which you all know about. Now we're doing them as virtual readings, but we're absolutely delighted that Quentin is our poet. She's here tonight, and we are going to be able to have her reading. I hope you are all safe and well in this extremely difficult time. Before I introduce Quentin, I want to say some thanks. Thanks to the city of Milwaukee, who has supported this series from the beginning. Thanks to the Letting Library. We are a committee of the Letting Library and the Letting Library has been very supportive of the series also from the beginning. Finally, thanks to the uh, Milwaukee Poetry Series Committee. Uh, two of the members are from the committee are here with us tonight. But as you know, and you hear me say regularly, you don't have something happen unless you have a group of people working on it. I also want to thank Willamette Falls Media. We are here tonight live streaming from the, the Willamette Falls Media Center in Oregon City. And thanks for all the great work that they have done. Now, to introduce Quentin. Quentin Hallett writes and edits from Notai, Oregon. She has four chapbooks, Quarry, Sliver Quench, Refuge from Flux, Stranger by the Hour. She founded Fern Rock Press Falls in 2004, and her work appears or is forthcoming in journals and anthologies, including Willowa Journal, Cirque, The Edge of Awe, and December. She has coordinated a reading series, High School Poet Visits, and presented workshops for the Oregon Poetry Association. Quinton received residencies from Caldera and Soapstone. In 2013, an animated short film by award-winning filmmaker John Hoxie featured one of her poems, To the Long Ago Maybes. Her first full-length collection, Mrs. Schrodinger's Breast, from Utter Chaos, was nominated for the Oregon Book Award in 2016. An aspect of this collection shifts physics vocabulary to some of the intractable matters of body and heart. A former art administrator for the Smithsonian Institution and the Armand Hammer Foundation, Quinton has lived on both coasts and in the Midwest. She's been happily ensconced in the Coast Range foothills for 30 years and counting. Of her current work, Quinton states, I have been working for some time on the notion of triage as metaphor. I'm as drawn to what is discarded or jettisoned in order to save something as I am in the thing saved. We're going to hear from Quentin after the reading. We are going to have a question and answer period. So we will have some questions from the audience that is here. And you can send questions in on the chat and we will try to get to some, to some of them. Would you join me? in welcoming our poet for the evening, Quentin Hallett. Quentin. Thank you, Tom. Uh, indefatigable host. And thank you for keeping us readers on track with the series. Um, I want to also give my thanks to the um, Milwaukee Poetry Series Organizing Committee and the poets I follow or join in this 14th season. The Letting Library, um, I look forward to being in your wonderful new building and the city of Milwaukee. Um, I'm grateful to Joshua and Willamette Falls Media for making this happen tonight, Ray. Mm. And I also want to thank 
first responders and second and third or 52nd responders and Anthony Fauci. I want to thank Zoom and other virtual tech for keeping classes, poetry readings, lectures, reunions, and alas, goodbyes streaming to all corners. I want to thank teachers, series hosts, poetry groups, YouTube um, tutorials, museum curators, the Smithsonian Panda Cam, Hamilton, and Carol Burnett to keep us sane. <laughs> um, this reading brings me back to the microphone on the cusp of being with you all in person. But because it's still virtual, there are many more of you now, and um, I'm grateful for that, all of you out there. <laughs> um, this, I'll structure the reading tonight. Um, having prepared for the third time for this reading, <laughs> I've decided to organize it into a sort of triptych, poems from before, during, and after. Um, after the initial lockdown and quarantine, but not necessarily in that order. We all got mixed up. And more on the triptych concept later. I'll read from my full-length Mrs. Schrodinger's Breast, my newest chapbook, Stranger by the Hour, um, and some during and late quarantine work, and I hope it's a good mix. It has been fascinating, really fascinating to review um, older poems for this this evening with the COVID filter overlaid. Um, I think that will happen to many of you as you look at titles or your work. Um, and now that we're living firmly in the Zoom era, I have the notion that maybe the poems tonight will be in their own Zoom-like boxes, like participant boxes, each one different, each able to be heard or muted chatted about or not, mm -hmm. and they're all connected by the fact that we're in this together. All right, so I used to begin most of my readings since, since my book, um, since Mrs. Schrodinger came out with this poem. Um, I, mean, I used to end, excuse me, I used to end with this poem. So I think I want to um, upend all that and start with it. Um, Dodge, burn. For the right exposure, shoot the gnarl, tinker a light whirl. Between subject and desired effect, shine extra moon. In the warm pillowcase, a clogged waterfall. To adjust the cumbrous press of doubt, there's a caffeine mountain, some owls dopplering, and geese dusky, geese white. Darkening the new page, Black lines, a bird abacus, waiting for sun to count wings, to burn through. Mm -hmm. Is that, that's a nice beginning. All right, um, then uh, the next poem is titled Self-Portrait as Bruise. And mm -hmm. this might have been a broadside if we were in the Leading Library, but this is now a virtual broadside, and you can cast it in any font you want, you can do whatever you want, but this is um, self-portrait as bruise. A blood whisper, I am the younger sister of impact, the lost hour saving daylight mourns. Mildew is my second cousin, once removed. I'm often surreptitious, the small chameleon on the back of a thigh or comma below the ear. If there is a fresh pear on the counter, I will press into it my yellow kiss. I've been called reticent, understudy to hostage and hospice, but I prefer to yell when someone sees I'm here. Thumbprint or thunderhead, my longing will never be taken for love, though it is similar in the way it uses quiet fury to aggravate intention and pools with me in one place far too long. Self-portrait. And um, there are several self-portraits in the um, Mrs. Schrodinger collection. And I think because of the past year and what many of us have been through, um, this topic might be relevant to more than just me. Self-portrait as insomnia. You know me, Morpheus's busybody aunt. 
I rattle around, setting quicksand along the verges of night. Disenfranchised from the land of Nod, no one blinks asleep in my house. No napping, no vampires in their fragrant mahogany coffins. No sweet baby crescent eyes sealed shut or lovers postcoital parched drows. I reprogram day for night at random, render ambient useless as warm milk. To be honest, though, flattered by rapt attention from um, all my little midnight monkey minds, I do weary of the incessant push to entertain and this diabolical graveyard shift. I think insomnia. Um, these uh, next couple of poems, I'm just going to go right into the, the mid, this mid or beginning of quarantine. Um, a couple of these are going to be in a, in a new pandemic anthology that the Oregon Poetry Association has just released. And um, I look forward to seeing all the other voices that will have been trying to write something cogent during this time. Um, from March to whenever later. She carries too many things in each hand up or down the stairs, avoiding banisters that might save her life. She sits down in the one chair with a weak back and it snaps in distress. She forgets to turn her vest right side out, neglects washing sleep from her eyes. Unable to draw a straight line or address an envelope without reaching its edge prematurely, she apologizes to every tea leaf for leaving it to steep and steep and steep and steep. <laughs> steep. Lots of tea. Um, okay. Another one of, of those, that, that period. Um, there, the word in the title, cartouche. If you, um, if you don't know it, cartouche, C-A-R-T-O-U-C-H-E. It's an oblong or oval shape, which contains um, a set of ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs. And usually the, um, represents the name of a, um, the title of a king or a queen. So I'm, I'm stealing that word. Cartouche in the time of COVID. Cartwheels are underrated, especially if care means stop and rock is never escarpment. One COVID cartouche can trump any card in the deck and carp are coyer than cartography lets on. Discard the bad seed and it will turn cargo or carmen in the streets of your great cities. Carnations can be underrated too, but carrots do not fail to mitigate. Carve your name in a fog bank before it carries you away. And that poem was um, part of something called, uh, it was part of the Two Sylvias Press prompt last April. And that was a marvelous way to just keep keep going in in the early early time um, of COVID. And um, one of the prompts for that for that that day was to um, find a word and use it in in um, every word you could in each line of the poem. So car and cartouche, etc., and carve your name and carries you away. So it was really fun, and it um, it seemed to to do something something fun. Um, this next poem is very recent, and uh, it's, we're still in this phase. The occasional poem, 2020, 2021. Occasionally, we percolate spring until it is thick with fall and fills hungry cellar jars. Occasionally, we jostle midnight, urging it to lay its velvet coat across the beds of sick children. Sometimes we hijack insomnia to the south of France, where we force it to eat subjunctive tartare. Often, you will find us pantomiming a striptease at 2 a.m. to the slow beat of horseradish. Rarely do we deadhead quarrels 
by doing away with the neighbors' mandolins and their vexing teapot whistles. Regularly now, we change our minds about bequests and leave all our daft alphabets to the feral cat who lopes by daily. And occasionally, yes, we do get serious and stop speaking metaphorically about COVID and elections for fear they might hear us and appear at the door, put a stop to any ungodly utterance, ready to leap from our lost all sense of taste tongues. So, enough of that. Um, <laughs> the next poem um, is from a, a small chapbook of, of eight poems um, featuring poems to the stranger and um, these, this was a big project um, the Oregon Humanities had um, several years ago to write letters to a stranger and then Oregon Humanities would exchange the letters for you. So you, you might send, write your letter as a poem or not and send it to the stranger and you might get an answer. But I just, um, these poems are to, to any stranger that wants to answer answer to it. But it also, um, even though it's a little, uh, few years old, this, this uh, collection was out in 18, um, it seems to speak to the confusion amplified and the word salad that some of our brains have been in for a while. So, dear stranger, I hope this finds you not in a well. Yesterday, since you did not ask, I ate rockfish for dinner. It was baked with sweet onions, Basmati rice was involved, and green salad, some Malbec. Rockfish, onions, rice, salad, Malbec, orange juice, grapefruit, granola. Yesterday, my elbow met bath bubbles, hot water, a black towel, and plush white bathrobe, flannel sheets, a blue shirt, the back of a leather chair. Elbow bubbles, hot water, towel robe, sheet shirt, chair, medulla, and cerebellum. In a hot bath of onions, the rockfish with no shirt cried for Malbec wrapped in a black towel. Rice pelted the back of a leather chair like salad croutons tossed. Gertrude Stein was invited to dinner, but she died so very long ago. Alice was indisposed. What is the opposite of identity theft? Exclamation, deforestation, Cree nation, incantation? Potholder, cold shoulder, file folder, or dodecahedron parallelogram quark, five billion years of bang. We ought to care. Time's up. Will it ever come down? Let us please take care wherever it wants to go. Sincerely mine, the inscrutable night sky with minuscule unclaimed carry-on. <laughs> So, I'll call it there. Um, I think this, I chose this poem tonight because of the title more than the subject. So, in its Zoom box, here it is Museum of Oddities. The dog split before I did, ran away for a year. I can't recall if someone we knew took him in while you and I spat out seeds and rind of a spoiled marriage. Before he ran, Chadwick, sweet marzipan, cringed inside our gallery of extinct courtesy. Our phantom anniversaries, I Google you, neighborhoods you might haunt. Curator of long ago pain, I noticed the oddest museums popping up all over. Corvettes, Pez, the Derwent pencil. There's even a cyber museum of oddities where a dagger of friendship is displayed with the pelvis of Pelagius, both quests in the Elder Scrolls shivering aisles. It might be time to join one of those quests and raise the museum of bicker. Who needs more of the same old saws in the gift shop, the same abandoned dogs left out back to beat? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay, um, travel and love and mothers in this next section. Travel, remember travel? 
travel. <laughs> we're getting close. We're getting close. And um, another, just uh, informing this poem, I think in the, in the big purge and cleaning and con Marie condoing um, of our houses, we find um, lots of artifacts and heirlooms, and, and they, their stories are leaping for air, just like the rest of us. Um, when my mother stole the ashtrays in 1954, what did she really steal? The Tour d'Argent's oblong sides cradle its iconic central image. Round as a Roman breast, the Hotel Edens is florid with incised designs. From an unidentified classy hostelry, a luminous seafoam square now holds hotel soap, also stolen. Too young to have heard her stories of candlelit dinners or with whom mother traveled to the south of France, now that she's gone, I make them up. On my desk, clunky Campari and Hotel Intercontinental Lisbon overflow with loose francs, escudos, lira. I never asked why she smoked so much or why her bags were too heavy to carry when she came home. <laughs> and a little more spice for the mother. Um, this is from 10 years ago. What Lovers Leave. A book of poems in another language. A crystal carafe with a stopper which never fit. A guitar melody without the guitar. An unstrung tennis racket the disgruntled doorman who opened a borrowed apartment on Park Avenue, l'amour fou in the library, the widely touted unbreakable ashtray smithereens at my feet. Mother had her own archive. There were uncles. One gave her his signet ring and game pieces she hid in old suitcases. Her codes on the family calendar did not mean symphony, museum opening. They meant the red silk, the black lace. Curators of circumstances, we thrive on something to polish, something to mend, something to be accountable for over bourbon and grilled cheese sandwiches. Leaving us nothing would not have been an option. <laughs> we hold on to these things. We do, we do. Oh, and then um, here is, um, here's long, uh, the, poem, the poem's called To the Long Ago Maybes. And the story about this poem, John Haugsey, the animated filmmaker who, um, he lived in Portland for a while. He's from the Northwest. And um, he, he was down in Santa Barbara and he saw this poem and he asked me if he could, um, if he could make a short one minute animated film um, uh, of, this, of this poem and what an honor to ha and his, his work is fantastic. And I'll, I'll give you the link to the YouTube um, site so that you can hear, you can see the little film um, afterward. To the long ago maybes, who I wonder were those pulsing boys calling me out of the house wet on New England summer evenings? Which of them used crab walk arguments? Which one fed the most enchanting assertions, wrapping his breath around my neck, soft as corn silk? How nimble each archived mirage. This is the time of year to catalog and stash such strands before fall's orange debris flutters to the pavement like feathers, before all the loose promises are snapped back in the purse. To the boys I forget and the ones I don't, thank you for being precise stones firmly embedded in the fordable brooks. Your slippery gleam lifts above all the rushing. And two more tiny stories leading from this poem. John Halsey decided that my voice wasn't old enough 
to read this poem on his film. So he chose his partner, Eva, who was a lot older than I am. And so when, when you go to the film, you'll hear Eva reading my poem. And the second wonderful um, happenstance is uh, during COVID, a few months ago, I received a letter after 55 years from one of those pulsing boys. And uh, it all comes around. Um, the link is on uh, YouTube. Look for John Haugsey, J-O-H-N-H-A-U-G-S-E. Um, and the, the film is Long Ago Maybe One. All one word, Long Ago Maybe One. And I'm sad to say that John died in, in December. And so we have the film, and this is the first time I've been able to read this poem since, since he left downstream. Anyway, all right. Sometimes a mermaid has to swim through a reading. So this one's coming in here. When a mermaid comes undone, inconsequential shells, sometimes a chipped agate, pay them daily to the gods of hazard. Stealth is your best suit to unpucker those drenched lips. Hide in reef shadow, Avoid black-clad grief divers who grope after their own hearts. If compromise swims by, as it will, upend that raft of innuendo and guilt. Don't connive or flutter. Go deep. If you let it, forgiveness will eventually save you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, next poem um, is from a postcard series. Uh, I don't participate in the very the big um, August postcard exchange. That I'm not sure it's if it's Oregon only, but there's a there's a big postcard exchange for uh, all 31 days of August. But I do write my own. Um, I try to write my own. And what did I do with them? I do. I I write them. I write them on postcard stock. They're short. They're they're fun, and um, you can send them or not. But this this was a an August postcard poem called Buckle. Lost its dark sheen, a wink from matted grass under the idle porch swing. It caught light last when a couple uncoupled. Wicker crosshatch imprinting skin. New owners of the house come upon it, scrounge for brass polish and a fresh belt. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> uh, okay. So the next poem is um, next poem is an ekphrastic poem. It um, it was written to a work on paper by uh, Robert Tomlinson, and I don't, I think it's too small to see here, but um, it, it was written to a, to a work of art, but the title, the title is Hovering Like Patience. And here again, I just think that the, this quarantine and the pandemic has hovered over my titles of my older poems, and Maybe maybe I'll cast something new under these titles, but um, I chose this for several reasons. Um, but hovering like patience, um, hovering like patience. Serafina, the fairy, founders off the Turkish coast. Glass floats carry fathomless resumes, and twelve-tone reveilles taste like low tide. Extinction is getting overpopulated by the hour. Dolphins chased, chase one last squid into oblivion. The splayed anthem of evolution stalls brown pelicans in mid-dive. Noah didn't know Jack when he built that boat. He, if he'd left the two birds in the bush, nothing would have bitten his hand. Hail to thee, blithe spirit, said the prophet. 
Saving daylight will not reverse the boobies' turnstile. Serafina goes down, pulling Triton from its orbit, and gets the little tyrant to play to pay dearly. Serenaded, serenading the perfumed glue of memory, some will trade tongue's warning for poison's slake. Shovels and picks will moan with the winch, then fold into quandaries and brine. To earth's last lovers, Kolai Gelsin, may it go well. And that's a Turkish, Turkish phrase. Anyway, just um, everyone who's who's writing, um, go look at your titles and look, look how the poem comes comes fresh again. Um, it's a little bit, a little difficult subject, but I want to share it. Um, there was a highly publicized murder suicide a few years ago in 2018. Um, a family, the, um, the incident of, uh, originated in Oregon and it ended off the California coast, the Northern California coast. And um, the family's name was Hart, H-A-R-T. And the poem is called Hearts. In name, but none are dear here. Children bucked from no care to these two who adopted six, stagger-stepping them in royal blue t-shirts and out-of-body smiles for the camera. Young hearts lived in fostered isolation, little army of mixed conscripts. Their two heads of household in retractable horns led them, led them over the cliff an upside-down happy hour where they finally escaped into the blue. Foster means to rear, to nourish and cherish. Though rare, abandoned fawns have been known to be safely fostered by a doe, not its mother. O oh, you, dear ones, who sew quilts beside the cradle, wish more newborns a long and happy life. Just, oops, um, hmm. Nonsense. What's more nonsensical? The dream where you broke the lawnmower, vacuuming spring shoots in a raised bed? Or sudden fire in a medieval Gothic church? Is it the man who drops a baby over the rail at a shopping mall? or the kid with four accidents still allowed behind the wheel. I say everything's a candidate, and death drives you crazy, fingering his worn-out worry beads. Oh yes, death is going to sound his bell on your street sooner or later. Here he comes, ready or not, like the good humor man. <laughs> Okay, not too much commentary here. April Fool's Errand. If I should finally have a stroke of good luck, promise me you'll shrink the wool sweaters to my new size. If I should fall under the spell of numismatists, take all the buffalo head nickels we found in the attic and bribe them to take me back to you. When you come upon a sinkhole on the cheesiest side of the moon, fly there immediately. I will meet you at eight on the dot. If none of this makes sense, why not go ahead? Tear that insolent tag off the new mattress. Make a new bed. Lie in it. And don't ask how I spelled lion. <laughs> okay. Um, a couple more. Um, this, this next poem, um, the title is a French title, um, and this poem's also um, kind of an ode to body parts. Um, those of you of a, those of us of a certain age um, may have encountered floaters in, in your eyes um, for, for some years or several years. My first floaters appeared on my 50th birthday. 
and um, you know, who writes a poem to floaters. But I have a friend, a German friend, and he had the most marvelous ter term for floaters called Le Mouche Volante. Le Mouche, so it literally means flying flies. But les mouches volantes is just such an elegant way to say floaters. And also, I've been studying French um, for five years now with the remarkable Amy Herman in Eugene, Oregon. And it's fun to stick a few French words into a poem tonight. Um, les mouches volantes. What if floaters are other people's dreams or the transcribed unsaid, sometimes lazy, these paresseux travelers in a summer sky are random strands adrift, at other times urgent, rushing about the vitreous with telegrams from the soul. Against white, none of them can hide. Against black, they stall, never completely still. Precious floaters, dear dark soldiers from une terre inconnue, Muster the extraordinaire inside my eye, you insistent filaments of life. <laughs> no floaters. Oh, there's one now. <laughs> okay. Um, here's um, one, one more um, older poem with a new take. Um, again, the title uh, wanted, wanted it to be in this group tonight. Um, and... It's, the title is Centrifugal Force. Centrif it's hard to say, Centrifugal Force. Like a bat, you cling with others to the wall of a barrel, head, hand, back, heels pressed against its sides. Moments ago, you stood on the solid platform, grounded by this excursion to the county fair, but not yet by what it portends. Too frightened by other rides, the bullet or the seasick Ferris wheel, you chose the barrel's tall walls and gradual tilt from horizontal to vertical. You did not, you did not, you do not to this day know how you can think yourself securely anchored in time then have everything you knew about gravity vanish in seconds. Who hears your shrieks left back there in frozen hover? And I will end with this poem. Um, it's a newest poem to end with and um, it has in the title Catafalque. And Catafalque, C-A-T-A-F-A-L-Q-U-E, for those who don't know, is a support for a casket of a famous person lying in state. And our familiarity with, with one in this country is the Lincoln Catafalque. Um, and it's been in use uh, for 35 people since, um, since 1965. Lincoln, and um, it is uh, the, the most recently RBG and John Lewis were on, on the catafalque. But, but my poem is um, for the more than 500,000 and all the rest of us. Catafalque tree, fuzzed altar with patchwork of moss among your flanks. We lean into you and your green sponge cushions our touch. You lie on your side in our woods, retaining an upright dignity. Old growth Douglas fir, fallen or felled, hard to say. You have resisted your, excuse me. Old growth Douglas fir, fallen or felled, hard to say. You have rested your solid history in this hollow of a five-acre forest. Grandmother and nurse to saplings and seedlings rising from your still fertile bark, you're the chosen spot where we place small creatures found in all seasons. Into your tender depressions, we lay to rest crow 
flicker, squirrel, hare, offerings for the catafalc of you. The time will come when we humans will join them, lie down in your majestic green. Honor the great spirit of renewable loss. for being here tonight and for that uh, delightful and engaging reading. Thank you for bringing us mermaids and floaters <laughs> and cartouches and from March to whenever later, <laughs> which I loved, and postcard poems and virtual broadsides. We want to have a little question and answer. And I, I have a question to start with and part of it will be while the studio audience here is uh, thinking of things that they may want to ask. One of the things that is always interesting to know is, who do you read? Who do, would you say influences your work? Well, and who are, you, who are you reading now? Who am I reading now is a good question, because yeah. it varies, and it's um, who doesn't want to pull every book in, in one's library. But now on my table, that's a wonderful question. Now on my table are James Tate, whom I love, um, Evan Boland, and, um, and oh, Evan Boland, now I'm getting a brain freeze. Um, uh, Visa, Wiesław Cizemborska, the Polish uh, uh -huh. laureate, um, um, on my table. I'm, done, I'm visualizing um, the new, the the new, um, um, the new Margaret Atwood dearly, um, and I go to those poets and on C. D. Wright. Okay, C. D. Wright. There, there's uh -huh. my stack. C. D. Wright. Um, um, and unfortunately, Tate and C. D. Wright and and Boland are all gone. They're on that other side, but um, for the, the reading them for the the compression, of course, but the freshest language, the freshest language, and um, and turning a, a very common incident into something that's universal. Um, th those voices really help me just get beyond this and this and this. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you very much. Great list. Are there any questions from I studio audience? Uh, Quentin has a lot on her desk, works by her contemporaries in her uh, poetry groups and stuff. And so uh -huh. she reads and criticizes a lot of work by her colleagues. Uh -huh. Yeah. I had the impression she has a lot of books, <laughs> and a lot of poetry books. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Which is wonderful. I'm always curious what got you started writing poetry and how is that process continuing? Well, Jane, that is a wonderful question too. Um, I wasn't writing, I'm not one of those uh, poets who have been writing since they were writing in finger paint. Um, I didn't start writing poetry really until I moved to Oregon 33 years ago. Hmm. And um, I blame it on Cecilia Hagen, a wonderful poet <laughs> and teacher and memoir, um, mem uh, memoir teacher in Eugene. Um, when I moved here in February of, of 88, um, Cecilia was teaching a, um, a general writing class at the, uh, it was a U of O extension at the time in Eugene. And I got here, I didn't know a soul in, in you know, Eugene or No Tie or anyone. I didn't know anyone in Oregon. And I, I had been writing, but not poetry. So I joined the writing class. And Cecilia's assignments were such that one could answer them in, in a prose, a short story, or a short vignette, or a poem. And I started responding to her prompts in poetry, so you could have fooled me. Uh, I, I didn't, but I, I had been writing, and um, I also am an editor, and for a long time, right before I, I left my, my moneying time to, to write full time, um, I was writing short fiction, 
and I was writing uh, for, for someone else's voice. I was writing a catalog, um, exhibition catalog, four words in the voice of Armand Hammer. Mm -hmm. So that, that wasn't me. <laughs> But anyway, but for, for poetry, um, it, it came with Cecilia and that class, and, the, and some of those colleagues, I'm still in a group with them uh. to this day. Some have gone to the other side uh. in, the, in that group, uh -huh. mm -hmm. but um, they sustain me, and I, I think I've left sh short fiction to the side. Um, one can do some prose poems and, and keep, keep that prose going, but it's still a po poetic uh, take. Huh. on it but um it just happened recently 33 oh. years ago <laughs> <laughs> well was that when and you said when you left the moneying time to write full time when did that happen and how did that go well that happened in in 86 um, um my husband dennis and i were working in los angeles for armand for for armand hammer we were the director and, and assistant director of the hammer foundation mm -hmm. And um, we had an, a, a background in, in art administration and, and traveling exhibitions in particular. And we, we had worked at the Smithsonian and um, had circulated Smithsonian exhibitions or ex Smithsonian um, designated exhibitions all over this country and really the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I left knowing that I, I wanted to write and not be an art administrator for forever, so I left that life, and um, it was partly thanks to a legacy from my mother, that same mother. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was I was able to give of the of that particular paycheck, and start mm -hmm. writing. So that was a wonderful mm -hmm. um, time. And mm -hmm. then moving to Oregon, just really the Oregon poetry, as as you all know. The, the writing and poetry community in Oregon is sans pareil. It's just uh -huh. fantastic. Uh -huh. So I have a question. Um, you said that uh, you've been studying French for the past five years. So do you uh, write poetry in, in French? I have not. I've tried to, thanks to my teacher urging me, I have tried to translate a uh, couple of my poems, but really not for the light of day yet. I think it's really a skill and um, it's a wonderful challenge. Mm -hmm. And um, I think when Poetry Month comes up, I think our, our, po our French class will be um, tapping me once again to, to bring them some, some poems, but maybe I can use that as a, as a prompt mm -hmm. to, to get something more. It's just a really different and, and a different part of your brain. Um, I also have another question uh, about your mother. Uh, so she was a kleptomaniac. Uh, <laughs> are those treasures still in your family? <laughs> they are. She lifted things. Uh, I don't know how many, but she she pretty much lifted ashtrays and and, um, and things like that. Yeah. You know, she didn't take the bedspread and the telephone book and the, and the shower curtain. And, you know, but, but the ash, we, we all, my sisters and I, have, have some of those, those ashtrays. And I think the hotels, the fancy schmancy hotels, knew they, they were going to lose some of these. Right. They're just mm -hmm. not bolted down and too beautiful. <laughs> that was a great poem. Thank you. She wasn't a klepto, no. <laughs> Can you imagine her going through customs now, a days? Oh <laughs> With a heavy bag. Yes. Well, we have a question in the chat oh. about your mother as well from uh, Ellen Contreras. And the question is, was your mother also a, a writer? Ah, uh, mother was not. She, she was a stealth writer. We heard, we daughters heard, that she wrote mystery, um, kind of bodice ripper mysteries hmm. that none of us have seen. <laughs> I, found, um, a, I found an essay of hers in a, in a journal where she was definitely trying to go in, into a different voice, but no, no nothing that was um, put shared with the family. 
and um, and she taught. She was a librarian, and she taught French at our elementary school. Mm -hmm. So she was definitely read a lot, and um, mm -hmm. but not. A, she wasn't a writer. Mm -hmm. I would say, <laughs> Alan. <laughs> Any other questions uh, here? I just have one. It's very. I'm a dancer, so I'm always really interested in the physical aspect of things. And I'm wondering, do you write your poems, or do you type them, or do you do both? I dance them. <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> I dance poems. Actually, I do. Yes. Oh, good. <laughs> um, no, I write law. I definitely uh, another good question. I I need to write longhand yeah. to start. So my notebook, I go to, mm -hmm. from the paper or, or a notebook mm -hmm. that's, that's chronological. And um, I just don't think on the screen. Yeah. So it, it mm -hmm. has to be the physical through the pen. And, mm -hmm. and I have fountain pens. I still, um, it's easier with a, with a regular pen. Sometimes pencil too, but I can't just generate um, something on, except for email <laughs> yeah. on, the, on the screen. Yeah. That makes total mm. sense to me. I do have another question. Um, I really did uh, enjoy the letters to strangers. Mm -hmm. That really intrigued me uh, because uh, I remember as a young child having pen pals that you didn't know and you would write mm -hmm. these letters. And so that kind of intrigued me, the strangers. So uh, do you imagine this person that you think could be the stranger that when you write the poem? Sometimes. Sometimes it's too. And do you imagine them to be a foreign person? I mean, you know, like from outside of the United States or that couldn't speak your language or know what you are thinking? I, I think of any, anybody, the, the, the everyone and the no one, the, the person you meet on a plane or, and you tell way too much to. There is a poem in that collection we, we tell um, extraordinary amount of detail to a to a stranger mm -hmm. often, but um, it, I just pick a different um, entity to write to, and it's usually a, it is usually a person, not a, mm -hmm. a creature or something. But that mm -hmm. could be a stranger, familiar. Or right. <laughs> yeah. Very good. I have another question from the chat, and this is from uh, Amy Miller in in Ashland. And that's certainly one of the features of Zoom, is that people from distances can log in. Yes, Amy, that's wonderful. And Amy says, hi, Quentin. <laughs> I really enjoy your wordplay, your playfulness. Can you talk about that in the context of television? Do you revise toward wordplay, musicality, or does it appear in the first draft? Mm -hmm. Sometimes it is the first draft. A lot of phrases or uh, the sounds of something that I that I've clipped from from somewhere. Um, but I do I do revise for sound, and I think Judith Montgomery, when she read for the series uh, a while ago, she um, emphasized how she must read the poems aloud to her yeah. mirror. And so I, I revise in to the a sound and a word that a vocabulary that might be um, unusual or different, a choice, a word choice different, but but also some of the phrases have come as, as a whole. So that that's more complicated than than I think I can answer, Amy. Well, I and I misread one word here too. It's not television. This is. It's in the context of revision, and you've already revision. yeah you've already kind of touched on that. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, usually it's it's uh, unco un unconnected pieces, and then and then image sound sound back to the image correct better word better word better word better word mm -hmm. just <laughs> keep looking for what. Yeah, I have an OED, the real old takes two bookcases, <laughs> and you just go nuts when you see an ordinary old word have 50 different definitions, and what did I really mean in that mm -hmm. phrase? Mm -hmm. So I revise to the, to the image, to the sound, 
to the and then I mix it up again mm -hmm. just and it's a moving thing mm -hmm. okay two more things from the chat from uh, Carolyn Martin she says congratulations Quentin lovely inspiring reading and an another one from uh, Alex Contreras Splendid as expected, always worth hearing your voice. Mm -hmm. So, a couple of congratulations yeah. uh, off the chat. Yeah. Thank you very hey, much. I, I, would, I would like to ask you to say a little bit about getting books. Ah, getting this books. Is, this is going to be on the credits at the end of the program. Yes. But we should say something about it now. All right. Um, I have um, books. I have a full-length collection, Mrs. Schrodinger's Breast, from Uttered Chaos. Yeah, um, and... I have uh, some anthologies. I have four anthologies <clears throat> that have many poets that, that your listeners will, they're either in these anthologies also, um, or they, they will, they're a good uh, chance to, to read a lot of um, Oregon voices. I have Refuge from Flux, which is an early chapbook from Finishing Line Press. And the, um, the eight poem Stranger series, um, Stranger by the Hour. And all of those, um, if someone would like to order or have me sign them, um, uh, just give contact me and at my email address, quinton.hallett at gmail.com. And I'll give you the, the shipping costs and, um, and whatever your total of the books. Mm -hmm. And that information should be on the screen now. And it's also going to be on the, on the video at the end. Right. And it went out to folks when they registered as an attachment of where they could get their books. Thank you. Yes. Thank so, you. So, some big thanks, a big thanks to you again. Our poet in next month is Claudia Savage. A big thanks to our studio audience uh, <laughs> for being here. And thank you all who are watching the live stream tonight and for sending in chat. This is the first time we've actually used chat, the chat feature. And we appreciate getting the, uh, some comments and some questions from Quinton. And again, thank you to our poet tonight, Quinton Hallett. Yay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs>